Providing funding to each of the regional healing centers will allow them to increase their capacity. Manitoba supports healing for the residential school survivor community. When you have things that are written into a law, it's an obligation for the state to follow through. A Tikamik leader accused Quebec of backing out on health reform. Holy cow, an, an Indigenous person, a Cree from Saskatchewan, made it to the National Hockey League. And the name of a New York Ranger All-Star lives on in a Saskatchewan tournament. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. It's been almost three years since the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls released its final report. On Monday, a Senate committee heard from the inquiry's former commissioner on how the government is doing in terms of implementing the report's calls to justice. Here's Fraser Needham with that. On all governments to ensure that all Indigenous women, girls, and 2SLG BTQQIA people are provided with safe, no barrier, permanent and meaningful access to their cultures. A total of 231. This is the number of calls to justice in the MMIWG final report. But how exactly is the federal government doing as far as implementing these calls to justice? The establishment of an Indigenous and Human Rights Ombudsperson and Tribunal would be one way to measure success of implementation. But former Commissioner Marion Buller says it's hard to tell where the government is at on this. After June 30th, 2019, nobody reports to me or any of the other commissioners. So the only way we can find out is like anyone, any other citizen in Canada. Uh, and that's to do Google searches from time to time. Former Commissioner Kaya Robinson says success can't be measured by government dollars spent or programs created. But they must do more so than just show you the budgets that they've spent and the line items attached. They must be prepared to show you how it has affected people's lives. You must learn to understand and they must demonstrate how their actions, decisions have informed and enhanced the lives of people. The response to the report is the Trudeau government's responsibility. But the former chief commissioner says the Senate can play an important role. What can the Senate do to assist, I think, uh, there are many ways that the Senate can uh, put a uh, very subtle pressure on the executive branch. Uh, embarrassment is a good form of subtle pressure. June 3rd, well marked the third anniversary of the release of the final report of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. The Manitoba government announced $500,000 in funding today for 10 Indigenous residential school healing centres across the province. The goal is to support and promote healing and advance reconciliation. $500,000 investment aims to increase emotional, cultural, spiritual and mental health support services, says the government, for former residential school students and their families. It builds on a $200,000 investment made by the province last September. Healing services will be offered by a cultural support worker or a residential school health support worker through 10 urban and rural organizations. Providing funding to each of the regional healing centers will allow them to increase their capacity to provide survivors, family members, and communities with mental health and trauma supports during their time of need. Specifically, the funding to the healing centers will allow for an increase in counseling and cultural supports and offer residential school survivors the chance to attend healing events, gatherings, and other educational events or conferences. The Quebec government has tabled their multi-billion dollar health reform plan. Most of the measures address imp the impacts of COVID-19, but the Atikamek Nation was disappointed to see few things addressing the fallout from Joyce Echequan's death. Here's Lindsay Richardson with an explanation on that. It was the hallmark of Quebec's 2022-2023 budget, an $8.9 billion five-year plan to completely overhaul the health care system post-COVID, though the details were unclear. The role of the finance minister is to give the means. A week later came the method via this document outlining Quebec's plan to improve quality and accessibility in the public system. I think we've seen in the last two years during the pandemic, 
uh, things that we don't want to go through again. The Atika Mac Nation knows this feeling well, but they say something critical is missing from both Quebec's reform plan and the upcoming plan to modify the province's health bill. I think the uh, government of Quebec has turned the bar to not be recognized, to not be put in practice, to put in application the securitization of culture. C.B. Flamand is the deputy chief of Manawan, home of Joyce Ashaquan, whose death at Joliet Hospital in September 2020 prompted a coroner's inquest and creation of an Indigenous-led health reform plan that the provincial government has rejected more than once. Y a-t-il consentement pour débattre de cette motion? Pas de consentement, Monsieur le Président. Pas de consentement. On est dans l'ère de la réconciliation, je pense. C'est un bon moment de, de s'asseoir ensemble entre les communautés autochtones, les leaders autochtones et le gouvernement du Québec. In a press release, Constant Awashish, Grand Chief of the Atikamek National Council, says Quebec is missing an opportunity to show courage and demonstrate a real awareness of Indigenous issues. In their statement, the Assembly of First Nations Quebec Labrador called it backtracking. Opposition critics see this too. When the health minister announced his plan, I just did a simple, you know, search in the PDFs to say, can I find the word, you know, in French, autochtan anywhere? Um, and no, it's it's not even there. And we know it's a long process, it's going to take time, but I just feel like we miss a lot, a lot of opportunities as legislators to do better. Quebec invested $15 million in cultural safety initiatives two months after Joyce died. In a statement to APTN News, Indigenous Affairs Minister Yann Lafrenière said culturally adapted health care is a non-negotiable. It might not be inscribed in the law on health and social services at the moment, but it doesn't mean it's not important. On the contrary, he says. It also doesn't stop us from putting actions in place. Sure, Kelly no, says so plans services, and policies can easily be neglected at the National Assembly, so having a legal backing is important. When you have things that are written into a law, it's an obligation for the state to follow through on. Lafreniere says he's focused on doing things right. Manawan, in turn, sees only one right way forward. Il faut que le gouvernement démontre une, une bonne ouverture sur, sur nos réalités, notamment sur la sécurisation culturelle et d'autant plus connaître le racisme systémique. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. We always want to hear what you think about any of the stories that we bring to you or stories we should be bringing to you. Here's how you can get in on the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us, of course, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see all of our latest stories. We need to take a break, but when we come back, a Blackfoot woman throws her hat in the political ring a year ahead of Alberta's next provincial election. But if we want to help to change and to guide the changes within the future, we have to sit at that table.
The Alberta provincial election is a little more than a year away, but for the first time, a Blackfoot candidate is seeking a seat in Alberta's legislature. Pecani Nation's Marilyn North Pagan is the Alberta NDP's candidate for the riding of Calgary Klein. North Pagan ran for city council in Calgary's recent municipal election. Albertans will head to the poll for a provincial election in May 2023. North Pagan says there needs to be a Blackfoot representation on a larger scale in Alberta politics. You know, there's a large reluctance for Indigenous people to want to step up to this kind of platform because it's not our system to begin with. But if we want to help to change and to guide the changes within the future, we have to sit at that table. So, but, you know, for me, my journey is different because there are no one at that, there's no one at that table right now that looks like me and reflects my values as an Indigenous person. Alberta's child and youth advocate Del Graff retired last week after 11 years in that role. APTN's Chris Stewart had a one-on-one -on -one interview with him to discuss his final report, which shows a record 15 youth having died in a six-month span while in or recently out of government care. Here's that interview. Thanks for doing this, Mr. Graff. Well, I appreciate you being here. Your last report shows that 15 youth in provincial care or recently left lost their lives from April to September of last year. Your report says that it's a record high. Do you know why the numbers are still going in the wrong direction? I'm not sure. There's a ver variety of factors that come into play. Some of them have to do with uh, opioid pandemic. Uh, it certainly has shown itself in terms of the, n of the number of deaths that we're reporting on. We're also concerned about the impact of the pandemic that it's had on the lives of young people. So much so that when, when young people are struggling and they are isolated, the, the, the impact of the pandemic just magnifies that isolation. And if they're really struggling, uh, it, it can lead to some very difficult times. 11 of the 15 youth who died were Indigenous, almost 75%. That's an incredibly high number. What can the province do to reduce these numbers? I think the Alberta government can take an active and involved role in supporting Indigenous people to care for their own children. The provincial government can play a very effective role in terms of facilitating that to happen and providing all of the resources that they can and all of the expertise to enable that to happen for First Nations, Métis and Inuit. This report has two main recommendations. Can you briefly describe each one? Certainly the first recommendation is related to the intellectual and, and behavioral challenges of young people. When young people have difficulties, those difficulties can be assessed early in their lives. And sometimes when, as they grow older, those assessed needs aren't followed through upon. And that can create some challenges for them. The second one is related to uh, the need for accountability for the government for what they do in relation to recommendations. There's, my group uh, makes a number of recommendations, but so do other groups. And we want for the government to be more accountable for what they do and don't do, particularly in terms of the kinds of, of uh, outcomes that they achieve. What have they implemented in our recommendations and what have the results been for young people and their families? We know that you know our governments are, are really quite effective at at writing policy and, and doing that kind of thing. But when we look at what's the implementation been like, what difference does it make for young people and their families on the ground when they do a, when they, the government writes a policy? Does, do they follow through to implementation and, and achieve the results that they're intended to achieve? Has the Alberta government implemented your previous recommendations and are you confident that they will do your new ones? Some of, the, some of those recommendations have been implemented, but, but we're concerned about, about, again, the implementation of them. Uh, so, so uh, you know, the, uh, the government may uh, say that they're going to take action or that they have taken action, but when we ask, can you tell us how much action you've taken? How, what difference does it make? How, what percentage of young people are, are receiving full, full assessments now that weren't receiving them before? The legislation, as it outlines now in terms of the Child and Youth Advocate Act, provides for only one requirement for the government, and that's to, to respond to our recommendations within 75 days. They don't have to tell the public what they've done, what actions have been put in place, what measures they've taken, what resources have been applied, what outcomes have been achieved as a result of responding to our recommendations. And we think that that's a reasonable expectation for Albertans to have with respect to child-serving ministries. Terry Pelton works in your office and takes over your position. Did you offer her any advice? 
Yes, a considerable amount of advice. In fact, we've Terry and I have worked together for the entire time that I've been in the advocate's office. Uh, we certainly have had lots of lots of dialogue. Most recently, in relation to this role, I advised her that uh, that it would be important for her to stay focused on the young people that we serve, and that means that I'll, uh, that she needs to pay attention to Alberta's young people, and she needs to pay attention to being able to move forward in ways that are respectful, that have the integrity of our office, and that really is, are focused on the rights, interests, and viewpoints of those young people. In fact, our office, over the time that we've been in, in existence, has advocated for more than 75,000 young people in this province. Those are accomplishments that are really significant and really do make a difference in terms of, of young people. The ability of our advocates, for example, to elevate the voices of youth is something that I'm very, very proud of. Mr. Graff, thanks for your time and good luck in retirement. Thank you. We need to take one more break, but coming up, highlights from an Indigenous Alberta hockey tournament that pits communities against one another for hockey's bragging rights. It's an honor representing uh, representing my, my nation and my team and, you know, uh, we're having lots of fun and uh, I, love, I love the style of game that we play. Welcome back, it's time now for our photo of the day. With spring upon us, we dug deep into our archives to select this photo sent in by Doug Romanek one year ago. It's showing a beaver dam in the early stages as it gets built across the Sturgeon River in St. Albert, Alberta. We need an update, Doug, send us another picture. How's that uh, dam going? Keep your pictures coming. You can send them to uh, us by email at share at aptn.ca to be featured as our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. Off to the east coast, we've got some uh, snow and five degrees for St. John, six in sunshine for Halifax. Kujuak minus seven and flurries expected there, and Nukshuak minus 10 makes a sun and cloud. Lots of sun in southern Quebec, Shabugamu zero, Montreal 12. 12 for you in Ottawa as well, sunshine there. Six with a chance of flurries for Sault Ste. Marie. Tapas casing, same thing, six chance of flurries. Big Trout Lake, you're getting snow, three degrees. 
6 in sunshine for Pukatawagan. Uh, Norway House, 9 in sunny. Winnipeg, uh, chance of showers, 4 degrees. Brandon, cloud, 3. 3 and a chance of showers for Swift Current. Uh, Regina, a little bit of sunshine, 9 degrees. Stony Rapids, 5 in sunshine, 5 and snow for Larange and Meadow Lake. Showers in 10 for Grand Prairie, uh, Fort McMurray and Fort Chip, both a chance of flurries, 3 degrees there. 9 in showers for Lethbridge, 7 and then a chance of flurries for Red Deer. 12 and showers for Kamloops, 12 and sunshine for Penticton. 2 and sunny for Fort Nelson, 4 and sunshine for Dees Lake. Minus 7 and sunshine for Rock River, Watson Lake, 5 and sunny. Fort Simpson, 1 and sunny, Wati, 0, chance of flurries. Minus 17 and sunshine for Fort McPherson. Polytech, minus 15 and flurries. Baker Lake, mix the sun and cloud, minus four degrees. New Yacht, sunny, minus 16. Tally Oak, minus 10 with some flurries. Same with you, Joe Haven. Arctic Bay, flurries, minus 13. It wasn't only delegates on the trip to Rome last week who felt something about the visit and the Pope's apology. In Saskatchewan, Métis singer-songwriter whose uh, grandfather was a residential school survivor feels that the meetings in Rome keep history alive. Here's Leanne Sanders with that story. They were like theirs. You speak his native tongue. They say, listen here, son. You're just an Indian boy. Released during the pandemic, Burke Jodwin's Indian Boy song is deeply personal. It's about his late grandfather's experiences in the Catholic residential school at Onion Lake, Saskatchewan. Asked what his grandfather would think of last week's meeting with the Pope. The odd thing was my grandfather. He was one of the most devout Catholics I've ever met. Oh, it just confused me. If, if they did to me what they did to him, I would, I would like to think that I wouldn't be a devout Catholic, but I didn't go through what he went through. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't tore down and, and reprogrammed. Growing up in Northern Saskatchewan, Jodwin felt he never quite belonged. He says the indigenous people on the reserve didn't accept him, and the white people in his hometown of Pierceland considered him indigenous and nothing was ever taught about residential schools in his junior high school years. I sure heard about Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue, but I never heard about this eradication of a culture, and, and that's, that's an atrocity in itself. Jodwin says the good thing about the meetings in Rome is they keep what happened at the residential schools in the Canadian consciousness. Um, the one thing about history is if you if you bury it, it's going to happen again in one form or the other. So these things did happen, and as long as we acknowledge they happened and, and and you know make sure we do something about it going forward, it won't happen again. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. 2022 Native Hockey Alberta Provincial Championships wrapped up on Sunday after a five-day tournament in Edmonton. The event saw teams from across the province compete in several age categories to find out which community has the bragging rights as the best Indigenous hockey team in Alberta. The games featured some high-caliber hockey and had plenty of supporters in the seats to cheer on friends and family. It's an honor representing uh, representing my my nation and my team, and you know. Uh, we're having lots of fun, and uh, I love I love the style of game that we play. And actually, uh, one of the promises I made to my team is that if we make it to finals, I will <laughs> I'll give myself a buzz cut. So that'll be interesting. A hockey tournament in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, over the weekend honored a First Nation hockey pioneer. Jim Nielsen passed away in 2020, but his legend and love for the game will live on. Here's Leanne Sanders again with that story. <laughs> Congratulations again to PBCN Stars for winning the inaugural Jim Nielsen Invitational. 20 teams took part in the inaugural Jim Nielsen Invitational. The Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation Stars were the senior men's champs. For organizer Milton Tatusis, naming this tournament after Nielsen will keep the late defenseman's memory alive. Tatusa said he'd lost steam after running other tournaments for many years, and hockey was forced to stop due to the pandemic. 
After the break, Tutusis was inspired to start another tournament and wanted to honor Nielsen, who inspired him when he was just a kid. He first saw Nielsen on a cereal box. Holy cow, an, an indigenous person, a Cree from Saskatchewan, made it to the National Hockey League. So I was very inspired. And because uh, he was very visibly indigenous looking, you know, he had the features. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, ever since then, I was I always had him on top of my mind of uh, all the indigenous hockey legends that have donned an NHL uniform. Tutusis eventually became friends with Nielsen and learned of the adversity he overcame to get to the NHL from his home on the Big River First Nation and then playing 17 seasons. He didn't go to an Indian residential school for whatever reason. He ended up in an orphanage in PA and this is where he realized uh, as he started playing the game of hockey on an outdoor rink uh, that he was uh, exceptionally gifted uh, on the ice. And so he was recruited to play for the Junior A Mintos in, in Prince Albert in a junior league. And from there, obviously scouted out and became property of the New York Rangers. Cody Michelle now finds Daniels with a shot and that one scores. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. The amylate has recently been named Alberta's official gemstone. It can only be found on Blackfoot traditional lands. The stone is made of the fossilized shells of ammonites, an extinct sea creature that once lived along the eastern slopes of the Rockies. Pecani Nation member Troy Knowlton owns Blackfoot Rocks and Gems. It's a business dedicated to amylites. He says the stones have a deep connection to Blackfoot culture. The ammonites themselves have been utilized by the Blackfoot people for over a thousand years. So all the amylite that you'll see throughout the world, whether it's in a, a, a kiosk in the Caribbean or a on a, or on a uh, uh, cruise ship, that amylite has all come from southern Alberta. We're going to have to be Googling more about amylites. Those are beautiful. Uh, we're out of time for your news tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We're always thankful that you can join us. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.